In the second installment, we talked about the existentialist view on freedom. People are absolutely free and they are accountable for their own lives. In the third installment, we criticized the very idea of absolute freedom. For philosophers who are inspired by Nietzsche and by genealogy, the dangerous illusion of freedom is something that's always there and something that we should be very critical about. In this last installment, we will talk about what we can call the ultimate challenge of post-war philosophy. The challenge to still believe in a concept like justice, to still believe in a concept like freedom, even when the 20th century has proven so violent, so disastrous, a century that might have abolished all our hopes that something like genuine freedom is possible. In 1830, the famous French painter Eugène Delacroix painted the image that he is probably most known for. Liberty leading the people. You can see this painting in the Louvre in Paris. What we see is the goddess Liberty waving the revolutionary flag. The goddess Liberty guiding the people over the bodies of those who have martyred their lives in the quest for freedom, the bodies of those people who wanted to topple the French king. Liberty leading the people is an image of the Enlightenment ideals. The ideals liberty, equality, fraternity have become the motto, the national motto of the nation state of France, but they are also the DNA of the optimistic belief in progress and rationality that has underlined the Enlightenment phase in Western thought and in Western philosophy. The Second World War has left us behind with a very pessimistic attitude. It seems we cannot any longer take seriously the Enlightenment ideals of liberty, equality and fraternity. Large parts of the continent are reduced to a moon landscape. Millions of people have lost their lives. The concentration camps, they confront us with the limits of human horror, the limits of our imagination. Now I told you that continental philosophy has as its ambition to understand the world that we inherited, a world that pre-exists the individual. One of the most important things for the post-war philosopher is to understand what happened in the 20th century and to save some of the optimism of the Enlightenment. Before the end of the Second World War, in 1944, the exiled, the immigrant refugee philosophers Theodore Adorno and Max Horkheimer have published a book called The Dialectics of Enlightenment. It came out in 1944 and within the Dialectic of Enlightenment we can find an analysis of the Enlightenment, namely the idea that what went wrong in the 20th century, in the First and the Second World War, was not just the result of an Enlightenment gone wrong, an Enlightenment gone awry, but was the result of Enlightenment thinking itself. Their diagnosis zooms in on what they call the myth of progress. For them, the idea that humanity is progressing itself, is improving itself, is a dangerous illusion. This argument, rather puzzling, has to do with their criticism of the view on rationality that underlies modernity and that underlies enlightenment. According to Horkheimer and according to Adorno, the modern view on rationality is an instrumental view. Modern thinkers understand rationality as an instrument, as a vehicle for control. Through rational thinking, through rationality, individuals learn how to master, how to dominate the world that surrounds them. We have already seen that knowledge and power go hand in hand. And this is one of the most founding intuitions of Adorno and Horkheimer. Knowledge and science go hand in hand because rationality is nothing but an attempt to master a very fundamental type of anxiety. The anxiety for those powers that people cannot control. According to Adorno and Horkheimer, enlightenment has therefore ended in totalitarianism, namely in that type of politics that does not only dominate the world that surrounds us out of an anxiety for this world, but that also tries to dominate, tries to, masters the tries to master the individuals that surround us. Totalitarian politics is therefore not the opposite of enlightened thinking. 
it is for them the logical result of a dangerous, a pernicious type of rational thinking that is part of the Enlightenment project in general. We can ascertain that generally, continental philosophy wants to give a voice to those who have been left behind, wants to render visible those who have been made invisible by political and social circumstances. In the 80s, the French philosopher Jean-François Lyotard has instigated an important and influential way of thinking, postmodernism. One of the most important books here is called The Postmodern Condition, a condition to be left with the bits and pieces, with the broken fragments of those high-sounding ideals of the Enlightenment. Those ideals are, at most, in the best situation, those ideals are far-reaching echoes of unrealized promises. But what can be salvaged from those ideals? Have they lost all their legitimacy or is there somehow a little bit of credibility that can be found when we look at enlightenment thinking? What is important according to Lyotard is the concept of the différent. This will be important for the school of philosophy that after Lyotard has been called postmodernist philosophy. The différent refers to a dispute that cannot be resolved. It cannot be resolved because there is no one set of rules that is acceptable to all of those involved. Those who decide on a set of rules to resolve the dispute are in power, and those who cannot decide, they're excluded. According to Lyotard and according to postmodern philosophy, there will always be people who are excluded from power, always be people who are left speechless or invisible. Today we are the 17th of March. The continent of Europe finds itself confronted with tens of thousands of refugees. Those refugees are usually just looking for a happier life, or in some cases, in the most horrible cases, for a basic protection of fundamental human rights. They are usually stateless. They are not citizens of a nation state that can protect their basic rights. This is a différent. They are left out by that nation-state who should protect their situation. The main situation of continental philosophy today is to give speech to those speechless and to make them visible. A part of their agenda is to stress that those values that we hold dear are not universal, that those things that we deem important come out of a specific cultural and historical context. A philosopher like Derrida, or a philosopher like Levinas, will put a category like alterity or otherness within the very heart of philosophical thinking. And both of those thinkers will emphasize that the things that we hold dear, that the things that we find meaningful, are always the result of a lived interaction with otherness, with ways of thinking and ways of behaving that are clearly different from our own. This interaction with alterity means for them that even our own sense of thinking becomes somehow a bit foreign. Even our own way of thinking, even our own ways of thinking are inaccessible to ourselves. We are foreigners to ourselves, a philosopher like Derrida will say. <laughs>